Now we're going to apply the boundary conditions to the problem, but for the finite square root potential, really the, the boundary conditions takes a small little twist. The principle is about the same, but let's see what's the difference. There's a difference in it because really now we have two separate solutions, which is psi A and psi S corresponding to the anti-symmetric and symmetric solutions. And we also said that it cannot, we cannot take a linear combination of the two. So a linear combination of psi A and psi S is not a solution to the problem. Previously, we had psi is equal to psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3, and we applied the continuum of boundary conditions to psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3. Now, we will do the same thing, but then now it's just that we will apply that for psi A and for apply that for psi S, and do not confuse the two, because like I say again, a linear combination of psi A and psi S is not the solution to the problem. So, the boundary conditions is this. For psi A or psi S, there are two, there are two points that we will apply the boundary conditions. That's when x is equal to minus a divided by 2, in which case psi 1 is equal to psi 2, and the first derivative of psi 1 is equal to that of psi 2. And when as x is equal to a divided by 2, we got psi 2 is equal to psi 3, as well as their first derivatives. And that can also be applied to psi s. So now, as we can see, we, are, we really have eight equations now, okay? So for psi a, we got four, for psi s, we got four, and it seems that we got really a lot of equations to deal with. Now, in the previous problem, we were limited in the number of equations that we have, but now we still got a lot of equations to, that we can play around with. But let's just see how are we gonna get around this problem, or really use the equations that is meaningful for the problem, or at least it helps us find the solution to our problem. Our problem, as I say again, is to find the discrete energy values of the finite square root potential. So let's see, what what we can do to find those discrete energy values. So first, let me consider the anti-symmetric solution. So psi a, I will apply the boundary conditions when x is equal to minus a divided by 2. So I'll just simply substitute x is equal to a minus a divided by 2 into these solutions over here. Just think as this as psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3, and psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3. Uh, so for psi 1 is equal to psi 2, substitute x is uh, equal to minus a divided by 2 inside here. That's what I get. I'm noticing that now the argument of the sine function is minus k2 times a divided by 2. Given it's an odd function, I can bring out the minus sign outside the sine function like so over there. And then I will apply that to the, and I'll, I'll do the same thing, but this time I need to differentiate both psi 1 and psi 2. Uh, differentiate that, the k1 goes outside, and there's a, yeah, the k1 goes outside, and since it's a sine function, I need to differentiate the sine function, I get the cosine function. Not to be confused with the cosine function over here, this is the symmetric solutions, that's another thing altogether. Substitute x is equal to minus a divided by 2, and that is what we have, knowing that cosine is an even function, I can absorb the minus sign. So that is what we have, okay, applying the boundary conditions for x is equal to minus a divided by 2. Uh, for the anti-symmetric solutions, leaving the symmetric solutions uh, at the other side altogether. That's what we have. I notice now that I got the sine function and I got the cosine function. Now, why is this important? Okay, now, if you were to recall our problem of the unsymmetric infinite square well potential. And, for, and it had discrete energy values, but for us to get these discrete energy values, we would really need all these trigonometry functions to pop out, such as the sine, cosine, and even a tangent function. Because it is these trigonometry functions, and I keep on going to this point, it is these trigonometry functions that, since they have a certain period, they really help us churn out the discrete energy values. Now, it can be a good tip for you for those who are going into quantum mechanics and solving a lot of physical problems, because these are only a few of them, if you have an idea that you are going to get the discrete energy spectrum, just be sure that when you apply the boundary or continuity conditions, you really get these uh, trigonometry functions, okay? Because once you see the trigonometry functions, that's a good sign. You know that the discrete energy values are coming up. As opposed to the hyperbolic trigonometry functions, which in which case we dealt with them previously, uh, none of the discrete energy values came up. So, let's see what we have. Now, um, at x is equal to minus a divided by 2, these two solutions must be satisfied. Now, this, I, I say that because uh, really, if I were to know this over here, okay, um, there's a and a and a c and c. Not only that, there's an e to the minus k1 a divided by 2. So, really, I can somehow divide the two equations together. Now, I will explain why I'm going to divide them uh, in due course. So, I'm going to take this divide by this so that really the k1 and the k2 goes on the top. This will cancel out all together and so does the c. So, I'll get k1 is equal to k2 and I will get a cosine divided by sine. So, there's a minus here. There will be a cotangent. The argument stays the same, k2 uh, a divided by 2. Okay, so now, I want to divide them because I'm going to eliminate these constants A and C. It also leads to the next question. What happens if I apply the boundary conditions to x uh, is equal to A divided by 2? Well, I can tell you right now, you just take at least 2 minutes to do the algebra. If you were to substitute A divided by 2 inside here, you would roughly get the same thing, just having a change in the constants. In, this, in which case, you will get C and D. And when you divide them out, you will get the same function over here. Okay, now, 
The reason why I need to combine the two equations because, well, firstly, I'm solving for the energy values, and that is in turn solving for K1 and K2. And secondly, if I were to apply the boundary conditions at A divided by 2, my objective would be slightly different. When I do that, I would, I would be able to express C and D in terms of A, and that comes when we were dealing with this transmission and reflection coefficients. Now, the, the nature of the problem being a finite square L potential, there's this no idea of getting this reflection and transmission coefficients. So really, yes, that is applicable, okay? That's applicable, but based on the context of the problem, we don't need to do that at all. You just basically get something like our C is equal to something A and this equals to something A, and that would not enable us to progress in finding the discrete energy values. We want to find the discrete energy values, that means solving for K1 and K2. That's why I divide the two, and this is the equation that I get. Quite nice. Now, if I were to do that for the symmetric solutions, which is this solution over here, I'll do the same thing. This time, I will also apply to either x is equal to minus a divided by 2, a divided by 2, and I'll need to divide the solutions after that. And what I'm ultimately left with is this over here, okay? k1 tangent, uh, k2a divided by 2 is equal to k1. And by solving these two equations, okay, noticing now quite nicely that I have two equations, and not only that, I got two unknowns. What are the two unknowns? k1 and k2. Now, what is k1 and k2? k1 and k2 is given by that over there, and as we can see, the energy values are inside k1 and k2. So by solving these two simultaneous equations, we will solve for the discrete energy values. Okay, good thing. That's a check. The second thing that's a check. We got trigonometry functions, tangent and cotangent. That will mean that we also get the discrete energy values. Check. So, so far so good. And for us, just as a hint, right now, we can't seek an analytical solution to this. Okay, if we were to somehow rearrange it to the best of our abilities, it's hard for us to find an analytical solution. Instead, we need to seek out what we call a graphical solution. Which is what we'll call next, uh, what we'll do next, graphical solution. Okay, so next problem, looking at the graphical solution to find the discrete energy values for this finite scale potential. Okay, thanks a lot. Stay tuned for the next video.